All right. Are we live? Let me just give that the... Just wait till we go live. All right. Let's see. Damn. All right. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm just gonna share this, people. Ah, so whilst we're beginning, I've just seen a poem. I thought I'll just share, state this uh, to begin that Kuchai yar me hoga kehi masrufe tawaf. दिल अगर सीने में होता तो धड़कता होता वाह 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 विच मीन्स दैट इट मस्ट बी समे बिजी डूइंग तवाफ लाइक तवाफ एट द हाउस और द प्लेस द अबोड ऑफ द बिलवेड पीपल ऑफ द बिलवेड अल्लाह दैट इफ द हार्ट वॉज इन माई चेस्ट इट ओट टू बी बीटिंग <laughs> I just went on Facebook. I just saw that straight away. I thought, <laughs> what the hell? Let's share that first to begin. Then I can share the live. All right. All right. Where are we? Where are we? Where's... Where is it? Yeah, who can I? All right. There it is. I'm just sharing it. Mm-hmm. And that's shared. All right. Inna alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-mustafa. Wa ala ibadi al-lazhin artada. Wa man bi hudahum ihtada. وبآثار أهل المدينة اقتفى وبعد فسلام الله على القوم أهلا وسهلا بكم ومرحبا حوان ينغ لعيطة بيان بنيدوس التودوس بيبول and of course of course سواغتم سواغتم بيبول سواغتم alright let's let me just bring my drinks closer the most important thing is to have your drinks <laughs> Once the drinks are all sorted, I guess it's all good. <laughs> all right, so you know, as uh, as the poet said that that just one moment. Nasha agar sharab me hota to nachti botal. Don't don't you think so? That if the intoxication was in the actual drink then the bottle ought to be <laughs> intoxicated meaning it's all it's all in us people it's all in the mind it's all in the mind it's all in the mind that's it that's the where a, can you have a nikah where the woman has a close friend as a wali and not a family member Of course you can. Of course, of course. Claro que sí. Claro que sí. Right, of course, people. Uh, I've got a whole session, which is, uh, I mean, a whole segment on YouTube about a wali is a guardian necessary for a nikah, where I go through the whole breakdown and I show that the, this hadith is not sahih, the one that la nikah illa bi wali um, is an, unacceptable hadith it's so i've got the whole breakdown on youtube you can watch it there i go through the chains and everything so is it permissible to join the british army right it is permissible to join the british army however i'd like to add a caveat allah because you see me as a whole i I'm kind of my understanding is a bit anti-war and anti like I see um and actually I'll I'll add to this discussion later on as well when I speak of the whole India 
uh, Indo-Pak war scenario going on. But you see, to me, soldiers are quite often just exploited people. Um, they're individuals who are dumbed down and exploited. And I say dumbed down not to mean that they're dumb. They're not dumb. They're incredibly courageous people and brave, but they are dumbed down by the institution of the military uh, in order to use them just as um, as kind of robotic automatons um, and just pawns for them to say, shoot, kill, strike, and that's all they do. You know, we hear and we obey. And they're not allowed to really think. You're not allowed to be a conscientious objector. You're not allowed to, if you are drafted to war, and if that war is deemed unjust in your own thinking, in your cognitive capacity, you should have the right to object and to refuse to participate. I believe that firmly. So, and I, as far as my understanding, unless the, the law is now different, um, if you join the military, I don't think, especially in England, I don't think you have that right to object or I don't, I mean, maybe you can speak to them um, because that's something I'm against. I feel that human beings should always have the right to express themselves. And if they disagree with something, it cannot be imposed upon them. Um, so that's my point of contention. That said, it's fine to join the British Army. There's nothing, it's not like joining the British Army is haram. In fact, it's absolutely fine. Uh, but the question would come to what if they are out on an exploitative element and you do you have the right to object or must you participate too? So you can find out by asking them. I'm not exactly sure what the, what the specifics on that are. Um, Right, ahlan wa sahlan, bikum people, ahlan wa sahlan, what is going on, what is going on, I'll let some of you tune in, click like, click share, alright, the hammer is in the house, ahlan wa sahlan, hammer, doing it, doing it, who else, people, whilst others are tuning in, uh, since there's some questions behind uh, right, I'm just trying to... Do you approach the hadith of Abu Huraira? What about joining the British Army as a dentist? <laughs> why, why would that even be a question? Like, why is that uh, bothersome in any way? <laughs> of course you can join the British Army as a dentist. I'm saying you can join the actual army. Uh, you can participate and you can, uh, I was just saying that I feel not from a religious perspective, but my own personal perspective, that I would just have that kind of, uh, uh, that caveat in saying that, do you have the right to be a conscientious objector if you are drafted or do you have no choice? I don't know the specifics on that with the army. So you can inquire with them. I feel if you have no choice, then to me that is quite, it, regardless of what, uh, whether it's the military or anything, I feel that that is an oppressive element. Okay, so I'm not sure what the current um, rules and laws and regulations stand as, but you can find out. Right, so whilst you're all tuning Ustad Muhammad, ahlam wa sahlan, ahlam wa sahlan bikum. People, a hell of a lot's been going on this last week. Oh, whoa, 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 what has been... First of all, before any other... Before anything else, so, can you explain the mention of Gog and Magog? Yeah, you can Gog and Magog. I've, I've explained that previously in much detail. Um, it is available on YouTube as a segment, but briefly, I'll explain that these things are mentioned in the Quran. Nobody is too sure what Gog and Magog, it's not, you know, this Gog and Magog is the biblical term. 
Um, and people ain't even sure what the biblical term means. In the Quran, it's Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And nobody's really sure what that means in the Quran. Inna Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. That Ya'juj and Ma'juj are being problematic, okay? That they have caused calamities on the earth. And Allah states that, and as time goes by, that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will... You know, min kulli hadabin yansilun, and that they are all everywhere and chaos. And but what does this mean? And what are yajuj and majuj? And then there's just the worlds of world of made up stories that people have thrown in there. Nobody truly knows what yajuj and majuj mean in the Quran when the term appears. Just like in the Bible, Gog and Magog, nobody is really too sure what Gog and Magog mean. There is a reference to them in the Old Testament. And then there is a reference to them, I believe, in the Gospel of John. Is it or um, is it in the Gospel? But the, in the New Testament, there's a reference as well. I, I believe it's in the book of Revelations. Now, Gog and Magog in the New Testament are not the Gog and Magog of the Old Testament. That the biblical scholars are very clear about, okay? That what seems to be mentioned as Gog and Magog in the New Testament is not the same reference to Gog and Magog in the Old Testament. So you, even the biblical scholars are being very clear that these things do not mean the same thing that is being mentioned over there. And Gog and Magog in the old British uh, myths is not what is meant by the by the New Testament or the Old Testament. So Gog and Magog in the old myths of the of the British kind of isles is that they used to be some kind of great um giants and that roamed the British Isles and and then um you had certain whatever people came over that kind of finished them and killed them off and then this became uh, this land became conquered and they killed off Gog and Magog and but those Gog and Magog of that myth are not the Gog and Magog of the Old Testament or the New Testament who by the way are not the Gog and Magog of the Quran <laughs> so uh, this is all chaos and the only thing you've got there is the same word and nobody s believes that these are the other things, okay? This seems to be a word that people seem to have been using when referring to extreme chaos, whether it was in myth or whether it was in reality, okay? So in the, in the book of Revelations, when they're speaking of the apocalypse and the whole apocalyptic kind of chaos that will engulf the world, and this mention of Gog and Magog uh, appears there quite timely. The same thing in the Quran, it seems to be in reference to some phenomenon of chaos from Ya'udju, from like how flames kind of fly up. And, uh, and this is, so it's not a, um, even the Arabic doesn't seem to make sense. It's not like a regular Arabic term, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, People have disagreed. What is what did it mean? Some people have said it meant some kind of alien species, like these kind of creatures that. And there's no real evidence to prove any of that. But it's an interesting theory if it's aliens. Uh, others in the past have said it was uh, maybe the Mongols. Mm, interesting. I think, it, and as certain people have said as well in the past, that it referred to, um, and that's also Sheikh Sa'di uh, in his Risala, uh, not so much in his Tafsir, but in his Risala writes that they were the colonialists. And colonialism, the way it suddenly engulfed. Right. Uh, sorry, just one moment, people. One moment. One, just two seconds.
Right, oh, sorry. Ah, right, that was an emergency of... <laughs> but anyway, all under control. It's under control, yeah, under control. Right, so... Right, so... I'll have to get that part edited. <laughs> right, now... This whole Ya'juj and Ma'juj seems to be chaotic. In my understanding, I go with what Sheikh Sa'di, uh, Abdurrahman Sa'di had said, that it was the colonialists. And I think... Um, <laughs> uh, somebody said, allow the girls. <laughs> <You're lying. laughs> Is that what you think preoccupies my time? But, <laughs> or are they also a form of Ya'juj and Ma'juj? <laughs> right, so, they could be. <laughs> oh, the trials of men, the trials of men. But, so, now, that's what I kind of go with, that it is the colonialism, people. Right, so... All right, Mobin, I'm honored. Top fan award, people. Facebook is giving top fan badges. All right, that's what we're talking about. You're doing it, you're doing it. Mwah. Much love to all of you, right? Especially those of you with the badges. You're doing it, you're doing it. Somebody's saying, is that a, uh, is that a, uh, is that one of those calls during my life? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't even let me do a live. <laughs> you can't demand it. <laughs> Only one of me. <laughs> right, so. Sheikh Ahmed al Tayyib described polygamy as an injustice to women. Huh? Injustice to women. That's only if you don't know how to love properly. <laughs> Maybe when some people are doing it, they're doing it <laughs> as an injustice. But when some people are doing it, they're doing it as an, an act of, of, of just love for mankind. <laughs> you know, this... Uh, <laughs> Bande bande ki baat hoti hai. You know, it depends on the person, I suppose. Sheikh Ahmed Tayyib described polygamy as an injustice to women. Yaar, kyu injustice, yaar? Spread the love. It's a... It's a... <laughs> no, the polygamy, huh? Polygamy, polygamy. So have we finished on, first of all, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, in case people think the topic has kind of intertwined and... Now, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are, are the wives surrounding a person. He's like, oh my God, they're from, from everywhere. <laughs> Ya'juj and Ma'juj. <laughs> right, so, the, right, so, okay, so that's answered that. Polygamy, what do we think of polygamy? Look, I think these things, each to their own. I don't think we should, as adults, interfere in other adults' personal relationships so long as things are by mutual consent, so long as they are. I'm not saying that people should do polygamy. I'm not saying they shouldn't. I'm not saying anything. Mera <laughs> You know, people will do what they want to do. <laughs> They're not going to say, oh, what does Mufti Abu Layth have to say about this? So, and neither are they going to say, well, I wonder what Ahmed Tayyib, Sheikh Ahmed Tayyib has to say. Look, I think one thing I would say is that things like uh, plural relationships, personally, they are probably a headache. That too, like a migraine one. <laughs> They're not like headaches of <laughs> like a small. This isn't just your regular kind of paracetamol case. I'm sure it must be like of a severe, either like it begins with a severe migraine and the spectrum goes up to like a tumor level. <laughs> That's what I'm sure multiple marriages must be like. But that said, uh, if people want to embark on them and people are happy to be a part of them, uh, live and let live. But you see, that said, I think that there should be uh, transparency. One thing there shouldn't be, this is very clear, one thing there shouldn't be is 
a kind of, uh, there should not be any exploitative deception in that sense. That this kind of um, misleading people and what, what's a good word for it? But like I've, I've come across cases where people will, you know, they'll have these kind of misleading or secret marriages that will be completely built on lies. Um, and I think that kind of stuff is wrong categorically. I'm against that kind of stuff. I think people, if they are going to embark on whatever relationship they're going to embark on, they should just embark on it on... Like, I understand that, look, everybody, they, you know, when they're building up relationships, not everybody, but a lot of people, there's an element of... There's a, like, like a kind of persona that people put on, a face that maybe... Uh, a side of them that they like people to see and I'm sure everybody does things like that and there may be some elements of if we can call them white lies or things like this and and you know I'm not here to to judge people and that's not what I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about where there's outright damning <laughs> kind of deception and so somebody will be married for example and he, he'll be misleading some woman Let's say I've come across cases who is not interested in marrying him um, if he's married, but he will then pretend he's not married just to to kind of get married to this woman to. And then she's found out later on that this person's married. These kind of things are wrong. Um, I think people should just be there should be a level kind of playing. People should if they are going to embark on these relationships, there should be transparency um, and then it's up to them, you understand. That said, if if either people, obviously the husband, but the wife, if she was, uh, if she was not happy, let's say in any situation, especially in these situations, even if it wasn't these situations, but if she was not happy, she has the absolute and categorical right uh, to leave that relationship, uh, or tell him that look. I'm not happy with this as it is either this or I'm out and she has that right and men do not have the right to control women and they do not have the right to kind of say well you know you can leave this relationship if I'm okay with it <laughs> you're not in charge like that okay so um, just to be very clear on that okay so if people do embark because I've come across so many cases where people have had multiple relationships as in plural kind of relate so they've had more than one spouse and in some cases the wives have been kind of okay with it in other cases they haven't and if they haven't been okay they've said on many cases that if that's what you're going to do then I'm out and she has the right to be out then and the guy can't hold her hostage to that relationship Okay, just being very clear and she has the right if either he's going to amicably they're going to be out or she can she will apply for a talaq and she will get that talaq. It's very clear. Right. So, so there's this misunderstanding that some men have that they think they can hold the women hostage in relationships. You can't. And that would be haram to do that. Okay, so because you would be causing harm. So very clear, that's my kind of stance on things. So I very like I don't believe that we should be micromanaging people's relationships, but I do believe that people should have a sense of maturity in their relationships. Um, so people to their own, each to you know, people to their own, we should, they don't need to run it past others. Um, if they're happy with it, that's all that counts. That's all that matters. Um, but at the same time, you can't you can't kind of hold people hostage, okay? So that's I just want her to be very clear on that point. Okay, right. So can you talk about the all right? So people, right? Coming, I want to mention this. You know, um, <sighs> Elaichi Chai, people, Elaichi Chai, Allah. That's not what I want to mention. <laughs> <laughs> what I wanted to speak mention is that I'd been on this uh, DNA thing that I told you before and I had some feedback and I was curious about the whole anthropological makeup and everything and uh, and I've spoken about that in the past 
Right, but through the DNA and being on the website, whoa, a pleasant people and over what an absolute, <laughs> overwhelmingly pleasant surprise was I was uh, <laughs> I came across my long <laughs> lost aunt, yeah, salam, uh, who is Irish, so she's my mom's sister a half sister uh now she didn't was com completely kind of disconnected since birth really and and although she's been on a long search to reconnect with the family reconnect i mean my grandfather has passed he's passed a few decades a couple of decades ago but she'd been on a like a a, a very lengthy search spanning several decades to reconnect with her family and and it's only when I took the DNA that it kind of connected us it found an immediate kind of match and um, we've been in touch since then this has been for almost a month now something like that or, or probably no actually over a month uh, <clears throat> probably about just under two months so we've been in touch and, and chatting and a lot of uh, kind of verifying a lot of information and finding out and uh and then we've realized oh my god <laughs> everything adds up not just the dna but everything and that's been uh, very um, it's been awesome it's been surreal so this um we've been planning and this last weekend they've been over here they've uh they've kind of flown over from ireland ireland people the whole family um so we've had them over it's been amazing overwhelming uh, reconnecting, getting to learn uh, about each other and, and see it. So that, that's an aunt and then I suppose my cousins, Irish Irish cousins people. <laughs> but it's been amazing and i got to say that, wow, it's... Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, <laughs> it's... It's actually quite surreal. It's not something that you hear of every day or that you think happens in real life, but it does, alhamdulillah. But it's been an amazing, and my mom's been very uh, happy about the whole situation and very kind of, uh, but it's been an amazing um, time. It's also allowed us to kind of rekindle that whole um, discovery about my, my grandparents and the whole family thing and uh, and really learn a lot more and, it's been amazing. Somebody said your grandfather was... Uh, <laughs> my grandfather, he was a legend. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's all I can say. I think what gave it a... You know, one of the things... Since we were growing up, that grandfather, my maternal... We always we always knew that he, he was a legend as it was. Um, but by the time we were growing up, his, his heydays had kind of long been and he was... Uh, he was like really ill at that, at that stage of life and he'd had a, uh, a stroke and he, he kind of become really debilitated. So we never got to see him in his heydays. We only heard about him. And, you know, through some of even the pictures and I used to see that he, he had a tattoo, you see, on his forehead. You know, the, the, the crescent and the star and just his style and the whole approach. We knew he was a legend <laughs> as it was. And he'd been somebody who lived in Birmingham from in the UK from the 60s. And great man of great courage and great strength and great kind of... We, we, so we always kind of idolised him anyway. As uh, So he was... We'd, we heard all these incidents about him. So he, pre-partition of Pakistan-India, was somebody in the army and... And that too of great skill and there was like certain stories like a story that he was uh, on a particular occasion that when he was in one of those um, with the army they had a one of the battles uh, he was actually shot uh, I think on his leg or something but he walked like so many miles but uh, he had to actually had come across one of his own relatives who was in the army with him that had had been killed in action so he died, he was shot and had been killed. So he actually carried his body as well and took it right back for the janaza and burial. And so these kind, you know, he, he was a legend. May Allah rest his soul in peace. But yes, so obviously these were his Irish connections. 
<laughs> Unke badolat. <laughs> you know, we'd... Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure he was a, a very charming man. So uh, so this is his uh, his daughter, my mum's half-sister. But anyway, that's an amazing thing. I did say I'd speak about that. And I mentioned that. But I think it's amazing. And it reminds me of the verse in the Quran that Allah says that, look, we created you from a single pair. Min dhakarim wa untha. Wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. And we made you so many different people like different tribes or different clans or different litarafu so that you may get to know one another and this getting to know one another is an amazing kind of process really so i um i think um it's it's something amazing really to reconnect and to do things like that so science huh science, <laughs> science. Somebody said, you don't look very... I'm not Irish. <laughs> uh, although actually the DNA did say that 13.5% or whatever was Irish, Scottish, Welsh. But that was nothing to do with this connection. This is... Her mom was Irish. <laughs> not my granddad. <laughs> right, so... <laughs> she was Irish and obviously then the daughter is uh, half Irish, half Pakistani, I guess. Right, so... See yourself leaving Islam in the future. Could I ever see myself leaving Islam in the future? What an odd question. I don't see myself leaving Islam in the future. Obviously, look, faith is, you know, there's two things. One, we don't know the future about anything. And two, these things are always, uh, from a faith perspective, up to Allah. But I don't believe that, um, to me, Islam makes a lot of sense it is something that makes sense to, for, for somebody like me it does make sense i do see it as built upon reason unlike other people so and if i saw islam to be unreasonable and if i believed it was unreasonable i wouldn't be a part of it but i believe it to be reasonable i believe it to be built on reason i believe it to have uh, strengthened my life in so many ways that you know i and and i kind of believe that god you know watches over me you know in that as i'm sure all of you believe as well or hope many of you on here but i i believe that you know about my my own life and my own journey and um you know it says ghalib says in his uh I have that as a poem written on, you know, in my living room downstairs on the wall frame, that, uh, that couplet of Ghalib where he says, Zindagi apni jab is shakal se guzri Ghalib, hum bhi kya yaad karenge ke khuda rakhte the. That, you know, having seen all the vicissitudes, the ups and downs and the, the stages that life has taken us through, all we can say, Ghalib, is that God favoured us. You know, it's like, um, and I, I, that really, as a person, and each person can only do this for themselves, like I can't do this for you, but if you reflect, you will see that resonate, that, that kind of, you know, that, that touch of God watching over, that, you know, in your life, um, all the tiny bless from the tiny blessings to the amazing overwhelming blessings that you've had in your life and i'm sure that if you think about them it would they would there's so many but they, there's things that will you think that wow that you know if had have i even planned this it couldn't have worked out so well um i i remember you know when i you know before i went to study when i was um just about 17 I began working in in an Islamic bookstore in Birmingham. I used to work for, I had a job as an, uh, I had finished college because the college degree, it wasn't a degree, but it was the, the NVQ qualifications. The way we had them is it, as soon as you finish your portfolio, you finish the course. So it doesn't have to run for two years. It could be done in two years or one year or one and a half year as soon as. So once I finished that, I, I was working in an insurance brokerage. 
Uh, but then once, as I got more and more infatuated with the deen, I left and I worked in an Islamic bookshop. Um, it was Islamic vision, those of you that remember it. It was, that, uh, it was in Birmingham, in Small Heath, and um, the place now, it was uh, IDCI, but it was the old kind of shop, the Ahmadi, that thing. But there, that gave me access to a lot of Islamic books um, and lectures as well. But I remember at the time there was this, when I got more serious in, in the months that were coming at that time and I wanted to study the deen, I, I took a book by, uh, and I met the author later on, by the way, in years to come, Ahmed Thompson, um, amazing uh, person. But this book, I took this book of his, called The Difficult Journey and in it it's it's basically a book about uh, I mean I read this back then in the 90s <laughs> you know if my if I if I mess up the narrative it's you know I can be excused it's been so long but it's basically about these guys who want to go on Hajj and what they do is they do a a complete kind of like they just like just go on a mission like they want to go by road and just they have very little like means they don't have much money they don't have many like they don't know how whether it's going to happen or not and and i think it's based in the it's real life events uh ahmed thompson is a muslim uh from i believe norwich or he may have been from london he's a, a convert to islam and he may have been i don't know whether he was a lawyer or something but he had a professional background so he sets off on this journey and they just have something like a few pounds and they travel somewhere to Europe and and they're just kind of grafting and they're getting from A to B to C and and the paths are just like there's a point where I think they land in Egypt or something and it's almost impossible but they get away with it and and I remember reading this before I went to study and at the time I would just carry this book with me and I was just reading through it. And I drew so much inspiration, not so much about the actual, they were going to do Hajj. I was obviously thinking of going to study, but of the fact that God works in, you know, in, in amazing ways. And there was a line from that book where he says that, you know, when he's reminiscing about everything, how it kind of unfolded. And he said that, you know, if I own the whole universe... I couldn't have planned it as perfectly as it happened. Like the way God designed it to unfold. I couldn't have done that if I had complete control over everything. I, I still, it wouldn't have been as perfect, as, as amazing. I don't, that's what I mean by perfect. Obviously there's problems. And that really struck me, uh, that, that, phrase that sentence this this meaning that he was conveying in the book um and i gotta say and i and, and i drew courage from it and i and i went off because i was only young i was just 17 just going on 18 and i went off to study and i have to say in my own life the way things have have mapped out have unfolded and and it's not to say that there's been you know major problems and things like that all along the way but still, the way things have happened, I have to say that it's it's been you know it's amazing how Allah has been there, uh, and I'm sure that's the same with 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 you guys as well, uh, if you think about it. And it's not to mean that don't mean for I don't mean by that for a second that it was easy, that there were a lot of difficulties. You know when I went off or even in life in general whether it was the struggles whether it was at times finances or health or falling ill or being stranded or just facing you know resistance facing hardship facing people who are awkward i mean all of these things you know facing hitting a mental block you know there was a time when i was trying to memorize the quran and i remember i was on i think juz 11 and, and i hit a mental block i just no matter what I did, it just was not happening. And I remember like it went on for a week and <laughs> but it was debilitating at the time. But then Alhamdulillah, I got over it. But it does. What I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter what it was that you get through it. You understand that, you know, that that 
kind of emotion, that will, the one thing that people underestimate, the human will to kind of persevere. That, like in the in the poem that a jazbay dil gar me chahun, har cheez mukabil aja. Manzil ke liye do gaam chanu or saamne manzil aajai. That, you know, if, that he says that this, the passion of the heart, that if I, that if that is, if the heart is determined, the will to get something, then the destination will be in front of you. That all you have to do is take two steps and it will automatically, things will just, you know, the path, the way will just open up for you. So, yeah, so I, uh, for me, this relationship with Allah is a very personal one. It's not something that, you know, it's not something which is built on superstition. It's not something which is just built on, um, like, because I was born a Muslim in that sense. So it is a very personal relationship. It's something, and it's like any journey, it's a turbulent. <laughs> From this side, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you know, being human, we're going to be bewafa. <laughs> you know, we're not going to be loyal. That's the human <laughs> human hallmark is being unloyal. And I think on so many occasions, I've uh, personally, I, I would say I've been like that. I've been very rebellious in that sense towards even, you know, if I can say, if I can have the audacity to say, towards God even, you know, it's been a very, uh, and it still is, as always, but still, and that's the amazing thing, that it doesn't matter sometimes as much as I've rebelled sometimes, even against um, God in that understanding, if I can use these terms, but yet you still, you know, it doesn't matter, that wherever you then turn, that you still find Allah there. You still find that things come together. And and that is an amazing. You know, I've at times tried to test things and I've tried to, and I'm sure other people have done it too, and even test with reason, you understand, like certain arguments and take them. But it's amazing how it you know, each time it's it's never kind of folded. It never so you know this is a very um, intimate kind of relationship, I feel. And, and, and I advise everybody to have their own uh, personal relationship with God like that. I don't think, you know, it's not for me, like everybody's different, you see. Like I'm, I don't consider myself to be like a very kind of that kind. It depends what you mean by religious, but that like I don't pray really nafal or things like barely just the obligation, <laughs> barely just the fara'id. I don't keep voluntary fasts and I don't do things like that. Um, I mean, I'm just being honest, but and maybe some people, they cut out like that. They do things like that. But I do enjoy the the, the tradition of Islam. I enjoy, like, I, I don't just enjoy, you know, it's not just me gusta, it's me encanta. You know, I love it, the whole uh, I'm overwhelmed by the deen on that level, in that capacity, and how just the message it gives of humanity, and then pondering over it. To me, that's my kind of thing, and I try to... You see, one thing I try to do is to have a clean heart. I mean, it's never going to be totally clean, obviously. <laughs> the Pakistani gene will always be influencing <laughs> the corruption, but... It's, you know, I try to that to have that compassion towards humanity. And I think that what could be greater than that, you know, and to me, that is like one of the greatest messages of this theme. Um, you know, there's a, a poet, Nida, I, I think is it Nida Fazli, who said in one of his poems, he said something, uh, it, it's kind of, um, it. It doesn't come clearly to mind, but in there, the message he says that, you know, he says, today we made a child laugh. Like, he says, Bacche ko hasadiya aaj. And, and he says, like, um, what is, and he says, I can't think of any act of worship greater than that. And, and that resonates with me, you see. So, 
So th this is, a, I think it's an important message for people in a time where they're becoming confounded by a lot of doubt surrounding religion. That religion, faith is not um, in the legal edicts of the clergy. Faith is what resides in your heart, in your connection, in, you, in your understanding that Allah is there for you, in your time of need, that solace that you find. In that motivation to be there for humanity, in to give in charity, in to help, in to make someone smile, that is really faith. It's not in the legal edicts of the mullah or the clergy, or and and I'm not to, I'm not belittling the kind of fatawa. Obviously, I'm a part of that tradition. I love that tradition, but that is not where you will what will firm establish your iman. That will just, you know, that's just fun. <laughs> you know, it's fun to learn. That's all it is. So I hope that's of some, some maybe, maybe so, hearing these words, it resonates with some people and it gives them some, um, maybe some inspiration, inshallah. Um, Mufti, do you know that you are an NP? <laughs> I'm an ant. <laughs> I'm an ant, huh? <laughs> a cha cha cha. But like the one that was communicating with Suleiman Ali <laughs> Salam. No, I'm joking. I know you're talking about the personality types. I've forgotten what uh, what it said. I was. I I did post it on Facebook a while back. Uh, somebody said folding the sleeve or trousers in salah. Um, no, none of these things are necessary. It's all cool. You don't need to fold the, uh, <laughs> you know, this sleeve uh, folding up the trousers. What is this nonsense? I mean, it doesn't, you know, people say like, oh, you must do it for salah. Well, the ruling's got nothing to do with salah. The ruling was there in general and it doesn't have any relevance in this day and age because nobody walks around dragging their bloody sarong. <laughs> And just to fold up your trousers makes you look silly. I mean, unless you're a hipster. But yeah, so drinking tea like the Indian pipe. <laughs> yes, people, we got to talk about that in a moment. The whole, uh, the whole pilot thing, the India-Pakistan thing. I did, um, you know, I have my book where I make notes sometimes of certain things for the Monday nights and... Bloody, I don't know. <laughs> I think Layla's just picked it up and put it somewhere. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> this is the the tragedy, people, of other people touching your stuff. You can't find it. <laughs> so, but I did, uh, there were some notes. I uh, will speak about the Ghazwatul Hind and we've got to speak about India, Pakistan. Um, and the whole... What else is there? We've got to speak about. There are some questions on that was sent in, but I will check as well. Uh, any any questions being posted live, people? So I tell you what, shall we get on to this Pakistan thing? India, Pakistan, what's going on? Let me just also open up the right India, Pakistan. <laughs> People, yeah, <laughs> what is going on? It was going mad. Oh my God. Oh my God, people. If you've missed this, you have almost missed, a, you just missed an early apocalypse. The world could have come to an end, people, honestly. And I don't say that in any, it could have actually, we could have been en route, set on a a, a kind of path to the apocalypse and i'm not joking seriously because these are two both are reason i mean both are an emotional country and both are nuclear strong so those of you that don't know uh they they both went loggerheads at each other india pakistan and we almost had we did have a momentary outbreak of a war um, over there, but it was contained, alhamdulillah. And I did make some posts on it, and some people, and many people applauded my posts, and some people did get offended. Now, 
I do have a lot of friends through social media um, who are in India, who are Hindustani, and I love them all. I love India, I, Hindustan. I have no issues with uh, India. Obviously, I'm of Pakistani descent, but that doesn't make a difference. Uh, you know, what was all of this about? Let me give you a backdrop, people. Right now, those of you that remember, there'd been a Pulwama attack, a place in Kashmir, a military kind of uh, convoy or something got bombed by a suicide bomber carrying 350 kilograms of explosives, which is like, uh, <laughs> how the hell was he carrying in a highly militarized zone? with anything between 7 to 12 intense checkpoints, militarized checkpoints. So it's not a huge place, it's a small place with several other minor checkpoints, but between 7 to 12 intense militarized checkpoints. So how did a car manage to get through these carrying 350 kilograms of bloody explosives not like hey like something the size of that 350 kilos but somehow it did later on it emerges as the indian opposition parties have highlighted that modi the prime minister of pakistan his administration and intelligence were aware of this attack something like eight days prior to it happening because they have, they've shared some, they've leaked some information saying that they were actually aware. Uh, and they allowed it to go on because it would then um, create a kind of war atmosphere which could be kind of deflected towards Pakistan. You could blame Pakistan. Now, because in India, people hate Pakistan, this may unify the country behind Modi, who has an election coming up, a general election in two months' time, and therefore he may be voted in. Usual politic tactics. You see it in America with the Bush administration. You see these people, whenever, whenever they're about to go down, I know, let's have war. You've seen it in House of Cards, people. <laughs> Those of you who stopped watching once, uh, Kevin, <laughs> once... The main character was out, but the point is that this is politics that goes on all the time. Now, Modi did that as well. So, next thing you know, he made a speech saying, right, we know within, within I think, five to ten minutes, they announced this was Pakistan. <laughs> within, they announced this was Pakistan. That was behind this. No detailed investigation. Just straight away, they did it. Then Modi made his speech that we will retaliate. We will take serious action. We will boycott. We will internationally isolate. And we will, com we will conduct a surgical strike. Surgical strike. <laughs> a surgical strike means we're going to basically attack some part of Pakistan. We're going to send in some commandos or or basically some of our military to conduct an operation within Pakistani soil. I mean, how can you announce something like that? That's just taking the mic. That's the next level. This is why you realize the level of confidence that Indians, some Indians, some Indians have <laughs> when they send those Facebook messages. Acha, cha, cha. This is where the confidence comes from. <laughs> We're going to attack. So Pakistan is as one of the most amazing militaries in the world people now they obviously were on alert but indian army they last week they sent in some fighter jets okay that came into azad kashmir which is um the pakistan side of kashmir they came flew in then they were detected by the radar now, the Pakistani army kind of chased them off. And as they set off, they let go, you know, released all their fuel and not all, but a certain amount of their fuel and also their bombs in order to flee faster. Now, they landed on a forest 
Uh, and the Indian media, people, if you ever want to watch what 200% propaganda looks like, you have to see some of these Indian media channels. They kill it. <laughs> they, the way they do it, like, ah, oh, you know, like now that they released these bombs, they just announced we did a surgical strike. We killed three to four hundred militant extremists. We killed them. Raat ki tariki mein, hamare bahubali, they went in, bam girate hue, you know, teen so atang vadi halak. And the way they do it, all the news channels. So Pakistan, right, um, <laughs> said, look, first of all, Pakistan kind of conducted an investigation to see what the damage was. And then, personally, this is my analysis. I think Pakistan may have not retaliated if India didn't overdo it with the chest beating. Oh, 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 oh. so Modi kind of went out all out. <laughs> Modi kind of took some cocaine and he was just all out. He was uh, making his public speeches. We did this. Everybody raise your hands in the air. We are like this. His speeches were mad. The media channels were going mad saying we showed Pakistan anytime we have an issue with Pakistan. This is how we'll deal with it. Surgical strike. And it's so irresponsible how the, Pac the Indian celebrities have behaved. Some of them. I'm so disappointed in people like, uh, uh, I mean, Ajay Devgan, I'm, he, he does this kind of stuff anyway. He's very kind of pro, uh, very anti-Pakistan. But I was disappointed in Akshay Kumar because in the past he's been quite neutral to be fair. And, and he said, Ghar mein guske maro unko. And you think, what the hell? But anyway, Pakistan had to retaliate. So Pakistan retaliated people. Allah! And did they retaliate? I tell you. They seriously dealt with them. I mean, on the borders, they, and so many other. And you know, the Pakistan media has been really calm and they haven't been exposing what they've been doing. Only a small percentage. And Pakistan keeps saying, oh, we want peace, we want peace. But they really <laughs> dealt with them. Um, and they sent in they sent in their fighter jets, uh, the JF-17 Thunder, which is a Pakistani-made fighter plane. People, third generation, and sent them in, and then they brought, brought, lured in the Indian pilots, and then shot them down. <laughs> and there's certain things on social media saying that Pakistan destroyed some military compounds or something in Kashmir, or they attacked something which they're not opening up to they're not admitting because pakistan in the public media has not been really uh <laughs> it's been kind of saying nah we haven't done much it's like one of those now nah, we're only talking <laughs> no we just want to talk <laughs> <laughs> now we're being really friendly here we don't want to fight <laughs> <laughs> that's how the pakistan <laughs> army has been kind of like it's been like look guys we are here. We want peace. <laughs> We're not doing it. <laughs> That's how it's been. So they've, on the media, they've been showing that, nah, we're not doing anything. We're not doing it. Now that they got hold of the pilots, they released the pilot, Goodwill Gesture. The world recognized it. And one awesome thing that's happened out of all of this is that Imran Khan explained that we have no issue with India. The only issue is Kashmir. That the problems, the heart of the problem is Kashmir. He brought the issue of Kashmir to, to the attention of the international media. And I have to say that is an amazing thing he's done. So maybe for once, there may be some resolution to this Kashmir matter, um, which is serious. And I think that's an awesome thing Imran Khan has done. After that, there was going to there was some serious danger posed on Pakistan where India in the days that followed two three days it set up its missile its missiles uh, and the intelligence was that it was going to strike uh, maybe three um, 
air bases in Pakistan or three cities. This was the Pakistani intelligence. So that was an incredibly tense time, really, because um, if they had struck with missiles, because some people were saying they were going to strike Lahore, uh, Sialkot and maybe Karachi. If they had struck Pakistan, uh, the Pakistani uh, army did state that we would have retaliated three times as much. Um, that would have been a full-fledged war. There would have been no coming back from that people. Um, right, and if that had happened, you see, Pakistan, it will, would have resulted, you know, if cities got destroyed, like if they, not just borders, we're talking about them striking a city, right? You have to remember that some people were saying India is economically far more equipped, like, sorry, is far, economically far more stable. It is, but it relies on those cities. Remember, cities like Bangalore, which are the IT capital of India, Pakistan had stated that it would have one missile aimed straight at Bangalore. It would have had, uh, like, you see, it would have been crazy. And I could serious, unfortunately see that have resulting in maybe even a nuclear war. Pakistan has in its, uh, in the sea, one of uh, its naval ships carry a, a nuclear missile, a potentially new a missile called Babur which is, um, has the capacity to, to carry a, a nuclear warhead. And that can be aimed at any major city throughout uh, India. And it's a, it's a smart kind of missile that it can dodge anti-missile uh, missile kind of rockets and it can kind of go over things and under things and that. People, that, it, it would have been the end of the world. <laughs> I'm serious. Pakistan has up to anything between 130 to 150 nuclear warheads. Um, India has something like 120. And certain nuclear reactions can detonate other nuclear reactions. And these are not like the Hiroshima and Nakasagi kind of bombs, just the fission. These are like the fusion, fission, fusion. These are bombs are, are you cannot even imagine the damage they can cause. And if so many of them detonate in a part of the globe and they trigger nuclear chain reactions, it can actually shake the earth off its axes. It's so powerful, these nuclear bombs. They're not like, this isn't something, um, you know, this isn't just child's play. This is th the fate of humanity could be impacted by these two nuclear war countries going to war. It's not, um, it is... This is the most volatile border on the face of the earth people as we know it. So it was an immensely tense time last week because Pakistan had, you know, Pakistan's intelligence is one of, ISI are one of the leading intelligentsias in the world. And they had intelligence that India was going to attack by missile. And I think it was a great thing they did is they, they released this information to the media. Because once you release it, you see, it's very difficult that they're going to do it now. Because they said that, you know, and Imran Khan said that there was, there's intelligence that India are planning a missile attack on one of our cities. Um, or on at least one of our cities. And then India said, oh, what nonsense. And the unfortunate thing is that the intelligentsia, the ISI said, that it's actually a coordinated effort with Israeli intelligence in India. And, you know, even Robert Fisk had an whole article saying that there are Israeli fingerprints all over this Indian war that is happening. And, you know, it's such a, it's shocking, really. But Alhamdulillah, Pakistan, it seems to have uh, immensely de-escalated -es now. Pakistan did an amazing goodwill gesture. And I think they really, you know, kick their butt in the process and showed them that you can't actually mess with Pakistan. And, and I'm, I'm really glad that they did. You know, I, I, I'm absolutely against war, but I feel if India did these surgical strikes, they needed to be taught a lesson because you can't just let them, you know, continuously do things like this, you know, just 
do surgical strikes in your country. And, and you know, people, some uh, people said that, oh, you know, you oh, but Pakistan and this and that. And, and one thing I realized, the media is so biased against Pakistan. America is with India. UK is supporting India on this. France is heavily supporting India. The BBC, their reportings, I was watching it, are so biased. I was shocked how biased they were. Um, and it's just disappointing. So this whole thing. Um, but yet Pakistan still emerged as the kind of victor. It won the, the war of perception anyway worldwide. And it kicked some serious butt in the process. And something India seems to forget is that the Indian army people is not actually a tested army. Like the Indian army hasn't actually fought. And, you know, somebody made a comment on one of my posts saying, you see, you uh, the Indian army has a larger weaponry arsenal and larger military personnel. And that is true. So the Indian and Pakistan, Pakistan army is at a two to three ratio with India. So it's that's the ratio of its personnel and its people it has pakistan has over 600,000 people in its active army and 500,000 on reserve so it ranks number 6 on the world's largest army but that said india has a larger army it has something like not just 600 it has um either 900,000 um or a million um in its active personnel. But India is so large. I mean, Pakistan's only 20% almost of India. It is so large as a country. And then they're so diver divided because they've got a, a lot of fronts to be on. But their army isn't actually tested. They haven't actually fought any wars. And you see, this is the mistake. And this is the same mistake that America made. Because America has the most leading technology in the world the military kind of capabilities it's smart bombs it's aircrafts aircrafts it's kind of t t guns and everything and you look at it like the taliban who are like basically like to them they're like cavemen you know they're like people running around with an ak-47 and and just wearing shalwar kameez and, and a turban <laughs> you know i mean like what are they compared to like you look at the military personnel the, the leading army in the world when it comes to technology right but they're not a tested army you see the american army aren't, aren't used to fighting they don't actually go out and fight wars i mean in iraq the iraqi army just just gave in they just kind of didn't fight them so that's not really tested now when they were tested in afghanistan they got their butt kicked because they can't they couldn't even fight the bloody Taliban 17 years and now, and now they're having to have a dialogue in in Doha with them in Qatar but why because you you can't win the war against the Taliban you've got a bunch of basically disorganized you know Afghans running around in mountains and you can't beat them with the world's most equipped technology because you're not a tested army. You haven't actually fought wars. And this is the same thing with India. Whereas Pakistan army fought in the Russia-Afghan war. It fought against the Russians. Right? For over a decade. Then it fought. or again, It participated in Afghanistan with those wars. And it's been fighting the internal terrorism. It's been fighting. Now, you see, when you have a tested fighter, somebody who's actually fought, and you have somebody who just knows theory, it's not going to stand. Like, it's not really a... So this is something, this is one of the reasons why whenever India goes up against Pakistan, it gets its butt kicked, is because it's not actually equipped uh, in, on the ground. It, it doesn't have any experience in actually fighting. So, yeah, anyway, and, and I think some... Uh, some people got offended when I was saying this, uh, you know, made a post and they said, well, you know, Mufti, you're usually the voice of reason, but here you're kind of biased because you're Pakistani. Look, it is true that I, I am Pakistani and obviously I'm going to be biased like that, but I, I try to be as fair as possible. 
And India did start this war. Modi, that's the administration. Look, there's many people in India who are against this war, who are against the Modi administration, who say this is propaganda. But the truth is they started it and they got their butt kicked. And they, and they deserved it. Okay, because, you know, you can't be a bully. Right, that's what they were doing. They were being bullies. Okay, so that is unacceptable. And I'm glad that Pakistan dealt with them. Now, the other thing is, somebody asked a question that, look, Mufti, you're not mentioning anything about uh, the terrorist kind of organizations in Pakistan, like Jaysh-e Mohammed. Uh, now, I want to highlight that, look, today, actually, as we speak today, Pakistan has announced, Imran Khan announced for there to be active operations uh, led against any kind of uh, militia operating within Pakistan like Jaysh e Muhammad or Lashkar Taiba or anybody like them. They are already proscribed organizations. They're already banned for many years. But look, I want to say something. Look, listen, people. You know, these kind of jihadi organizations, yeah, uh, they, look, they are a problem in Pakistan. Okay, Pakistan has, you know, Pakistan is like an, um, like a mesh, an amalgamation of very different kind of people. It's like in America. Look, America has some people who are the most, the leading humanists on this globe, right? Right. Some Americans are like leading on humanism, on human rights, on all kinds of rights. They are the pioneers on this globe, some, some Americans. And then you get some Americans who are like redneck, kind of complete hillbillies like you're gonna have complete opposite ends and pakistan is the same like pakistan you will get these nutcase extremists mulvies you will get some of these people like in the asia bb case they just you know oh, become a mob and oh, you know cavemen like you get that and then you will get some people who are so intelligent in in pakistan and Intelligence is of different kinds, by the way. You're going to get, like, obviously, uh, emotional intelligence, creative intelligence. And there is that as well. But, like, there's, there's a kind of, like, a Machiavellian kind of intelligence, which is like a, a kind of survival intelligence. That, that, you know, to kind of outdo the other in your survival. And I think there's several Pakistanis who are so gifted with this. That in this kind of, almost like that kind of deceptive intelligence. And, and, the, and the interesting thing is that psychology says, in one of the theories, the intelligence hypothesis, is that it developed in outmaneuvering the opponent. Uh, that's how intelligence was formed as an act of survival. And I think on these things, there's some Pakistanis who are so on it. You know, in a in a like chalak kind of way that they are like this kind of conniving, and this is why the ISI is so one of the leading intelligence things in the world, intelligentsias. But coming to this point, that there are some nutcases and extremist organizations in Pakistan, like this Jaysh e Muhammad and Lashkar Taiba and other kind of nutcases as well. You do have them, but people. You have to understand that the, this militant mindset began with the Americans wanting to flood the Muslim world, places like Pakistan and Saudi, especially Pakistan, with this to support this idea to support the Mujahideen fighting Russia during the Afghan Russia war in the uh, from the early 80s right through. And Pakistan partook in that. Now, so there was like a full green flag on you can s do whatever you want. And there was CIA funding. Now, you can read what Noam Chomsky writes about the war on terror, that the CIA have a key role in the creation of this extremist kind of jihadi. Now, the problem is that, look, they've been creating them and supporting them. That, that happened. Then there was the 90s where they were flourishing. And then there's been the crackdown following 9-11. But look, extremists that have been living like this and growing up and infesting in Pakistan for at least three decades, you can't 
to eradicate them overnight is very hard. It's going to be very difficult because these are people who are so rooted in that country. So it is going to take time. Right. So I do agree that this is a problem. It is a virus in Pakistan. But I do believe that Imran Khan and other people are trying to uproot them. But it is going to take time because it's taken decades for them to take root. Right. So this is something that we have to be fear about. And some Indians did ask me, some people, only some, that look, how come you're not condemning? I do condemn Jaysh and Muhammad. I do condemn these organizations. But look, let's just be fair that, look, they, if you t these extremist organizations have to be condemned everywhere. What about India? Look, what about the Modi administration? The Modi... Prime Minister Modi was a part of, he was an, a member of Shiv Sena. Shiv Sena is the equivalent of Jaysh -e Muhammad. In fact, Sena means army, which is what Jaysh means. And Jaysh -e Muhammad, the army of Muhammad, but the army of, of Shiv, of, you know, of, of Shiva. Now, the point is that Shiv Sena is an extremist right wing fascist organization that hates Muslims. He was a part of that. He was part of the cover-up of the Gujarat massacre that happened where they butchered Muslims. Since he's been in power, the situation in Kashmir has deteriorated. Kashmir, what's happening there is terrorism. The army imposing politic, for political gains, imposing um, their kind of might, oppressing, killing, blinding, uh, butchering. Is that not terrorism? So th that's terrorism. So you have to condemn everything. You know, you co I condemn the terrorism in Pakistan and, I e and the extremists, but I equally condemn the ones in India. You know, those like Shiv Sena and these right wing fascists and saying that any, you know, th that you can't eat beef. That, oh, if you eat beef, beef is Hamari Mata. You know, this is our mother, the cow. For God's sake, a cow is more valuable than a human being. That what the hell is that about? How can a cow, goddamn cow, be more valuable than a human being? You know, like, oh, Gai Mata, you know, and, and, and this kind of nonsense, because in essence, Hinduism is meant to be about peace. It isn't this kind of right wing. And let's just be, let's be fair. Look, let's separate Hindutva, the right wing kind of Hindus, from Hinduism. And some people have been just hating on Hindus nonstop. And, and I, I request and I plead to th them that, look, don't do that, please. Because, look, Hinduism is based on peace. OK, that it's not fair to brand all Hindus and start taking the mick out of all Hindus, because that is not true. They are not like that. All Hindus are not. You know, and some people are saying, oh, you know, they drink cow piss and they do this and they do that. And I saw so many people saying this and I saw people doing the hashtag, you know, gay Hind instead of Jay Hind. And this kind of stuff, I condemn it. I utterly condemn. And I am, you know, I am, like I said, I'm proud of how the way Pakistan stood up for. And I'm proud that the they, they kind of kick, you know, taught them a lesson but this is wrong and wrong is wrong you know you can we cannot condone anything that that is utterly unacceptable like like you know this blanket guilt of all indians are wrong they're not the administration is not all india and hindus are not fascist but there is Hindutva, which is a fascist, the fascist part of Hinduism, just as you have Muslim extremists, are not all Muslims, are not the majority of Muslims. So the same way we shouldn't be kind of just mocking, uh, I mean, not mo uh, in this thing, we shouldn't be attacking. And people shouldn't be kind of like attacking Hindus or making slogans against Hindus and, and saying, oh, this and that. But against right wing Hindus, fine against the right-wing fascism, against the Hindutva, against the Shiv Sena, against those organizations, yes, but not against your regular Hindu, okay? Because and at the end of the day, you know, the, the, see, nobody really wants people, human beings just want to live in peace. Fundamentally, you know, if you bring, if you get down to the point, people just want peace. They just want to be left alone, you know, junk. 
I, there's this poem that I, I read the other day that Jang to khud hi ek masla hai Jang maslon ka hal kya deki You know that that war in and of itself is a calamity how can it be the solution to any calamity so th these were some things that were kind of bothering me and i wanted to say and i understand that you know in india and i feel for indian muslims because in india indian muslims have no freedom when it comes to anything the governments do like they can't be critic and it e ever if it's to do with pakistan in the equation they have to at all times be anti-Pakistan. Otherwise, they get lynched. You know, they, they, it's not like, it's not just about sucking up. You know, I, Indian, they don't do this just to suck up. Because, but they do this because they will be attacked. They will be, you know, they, there isn't a, the, people just go mad. You know, I saw the uh, the Indian politician, the Muslim who I follow him sometimes on social media. Uh, what's his name? Um, from the Oasi brothers. The um, But the elder, the brother from Hyderabad who has his uh, all Muslim party in India. And I saw how he was being very unnecessarily critical towards Pakistan. And I understand obviously he's Indian and he's not Pakistani and he can be, but he has to be. Because he's a Muslim and he's got a beard and he wears a hat and if he and he's a politician and if he doesn't appear to be anti-Pakistan, the Indians will lynch him, the Hindus, the, the right wing, and then they will just incite the mob. And and, and the, the, it's a sad state of affairs, Wallahi. And I do feel and may Allah grant ease to all these people and may Allah seriously allow, I mean, may Allah facilitate for the right-wing fascists to be removed in places like India and for them to enjoy the secular uh, freedoms that they have and the secular state that they have. I mean, but much love to everybody. I, I just wanted to say that, look, on both sides and even the Indian army, look, I, I don't have anything against the Indian army I, as a person and I respect them. And they're just your common person that are being forced to kind of like go out to war and a lot of them are suffering they are low caste people put forward to go forth and just die and they don't want to and they're not even equipped properly um but the soldiers this comes back to my question that i said earlier on soldiers are always exploited people this is what my problem with armies as a whole that uh that they are usually exploited for the you know to fill the pockets of rich politicians uh, and the people who suffer in the end are the families who lose soldiers you know the the mother that has to uh, bury her ch her son and things like this and, and this is all politics at the end of the day and so even though in this scenario I, I am very grateful to the and very proud of the Pakistani army for defending the soil and for defending their right as a sovereign state and i am proud of them but in general globally just speaking on you know detached from that topic that the armies of the world this is all they do they're just pawns and people exploit them so right uh okay right whoa 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 let's take a few questions uh right i'd been asked a question that is the abrogation in the Quran and then I'll try to actually people sorry before I get distracted let's deal quickly with the Ghazwatul Hind uh, topic right so people have asked me there are because it's relevant to what I've just been saying that there are certain hadith that speak of India and that towards the end of time Muslims will conquer India is this true this is known as the Ghazwatul Hind uh, kind of prophecies and there's so many hadith of them, so many about things like Ghazwatul Hind that uh, some scholars have said that you could compile an entire book just based on all of these narrations to do with Ghazwatul Hind, to do with the battle ag against India. Now, I want to clarify first straight away 
there is not a single Sahih Hadith on the Battle of India. There is no such thing. It is very, it is not from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These things were fabricated and made up later on. Um, there is no, and you, we've got to understand that these were used as political ploys, okay, to kind of strengthen people's causes. Now, most likely, I think that the first one may, that these kind of may have first appeared to support uh, the Umayyad campaign into India. So when um, uh, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi had commissioned Muhammad ibn Qasim to go and launch an attack on, uh, on India, which is Sindh. Remember that whole thing was uh, a Hind. Now, in my, in my understanding, that's when these hadith would have probably been fabricated. To say that uh, you know the prophet said that these this army will be supported that attacks uh, India and fights against India. All of these hadith are baseless. Um, most of these hadith uh, really are transmitted through Abu Huraira radiallahu an through utterly weak and unacceptable chains. Now there is they try to say one chain that they try to base it on. Um, is uh, that of, they try to say, Thoban, who was the servant of the Prophet, that his chain is reli <coughs> reliable. This is what some people try to say, and it's in the Musnad of Ahmad, and it's in Nasa'i, and things like this. Now, this chain reads that Haddathana Abu Nadr, who says Haddathana Baqiyya, from Abdu, uh, um, Haddathana Abdullah ibn Salim, or Abu Bakr ibn Walid al Zubaydi, and Muhammad ibn Walid al-Zubaydi and Luqman ibn Amir al-Wusabi and Abd al-A'la ibn Adi al-Bahrain uh, al uh, sorry and Abd al-A'la ibn Adi and Thawban the, the servant of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said that two groups of people from my ummah uh, Allah will preserve them from the hellfire one group who fights India or Hindustan and the land of Hind and the other who fights with Jesus <laughs> and you can see why this hadith is totally fabricated um, because there isn't a single hadith about the second coming of Jesus that is authentic and but put that aside this is what they say is the strongest chain now first of all it comes in Nasa'i in other books and and when it's transmitted in many of the places it's an it says an an and the first, uh, the, the key person that emerges first of all is Baqiyya ibn al Walid, who is utterly unacceptable if he says An, because he is known as a major mudallis who would do tadlis from weak people. In fact, they even say, Kun ala taqiyya min hadith Baqiyya. That's actually one of the poems uh, that uh, the, the muhaddithin would write that beware of the hadith of Baqiyya. He's in the chain, but even when he says Haddathana, as he says here, I still wouldn't accept uh, his narration. But that said, those who want to accept him, the next problem is that Abu Bakr ibn al-Walid, uh, as Zubaydi in this chain, um, he is uh, unknown. We don't know who he is. But people will say, people will say, oh, but there's another person with him, uh, Abdullah ibn Salim al-Hamsi, who's also narrating this. But then let's go on. This, all of these narrations come through one person from Thoban. It's coming through one person, all right. Um, it's restricted through him, and that is Luqman ibn Amir al Wasabi, right? So, Luqman ibn Amir now he is somebody who is not a uh, reliable narrator. He has been at, by some people, he's been placed as he's just about kind of okay so ibn hajar says he's saduq from the thalitha from a kind of lower category as in he's uh saduq is somebody who we think you know in and of himself is a truthful person but is he reliable because being truthful is doesn't mean you have a good memory it doesn't mean that you're good at transmitting things but in and of yourself you're a truthful person that's what ibn hajar says now, when a truthful person is doing, even though some people did say he's thiqa, I accept that, 
But Ibn Hajar says he's just Saduq and some people like Abu Hatim says, okay, we can write what he says. But when he has tafarrud, so this means this riwayah only rests on him. How can it be accepted? Um, so that's part of the problem that we've got here. Now, and you've got people... Uh, and so even people, by the way, in case somebody's going to question, where do you, where can I find things like this? So even uh, uh, Al-Zahabi does state that in his Mawqidha, he writes that the tafarrud of the Saduq, of somebody who's described as Saduq, his tafarrud is not acceptable. Okay, so I, I'm, not, I'm not blagging, you know, this one. <laughs> this one, <laughs> the, the ulama are saying this, right? So... That and then this this thing to do with India, you find a lot of hadith speaking of the black flags, that there will be this army of black flags. And I know ISIS tried to use this as well. And I know the Taliban tried to use this as well. And it says that there will be an army of black flags from my ummah that will come from Khurasan, which is like the east and it was part of like Afghanistan or that part of the world was called Khurasan. Now... People say, oh, what about... There isn't a single hadith that is sahih to do with the black flags. Okay. Uh, in fact, Sheikh Hatim al-Awni, uh, the Saudi scholar, has an entire uh, uh, article dedicated to this where he goes through all of them highlighting that they're highlighting that there isn't a single sahih hadith here. Okay, on the black flags. People like uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Zubair Ali Zai has also written on this, highlighting there are no Sahih Hadith on the black flags, and other people have. Uh, and this, people, was a propaganda uh, that emerged most likely with the rise of the Abbasids. Because the Abbasids, when they came to take over the Umayyads in, and the, the uprising in the year of 131 Hijri, they came from Khurasan. And they came with black flags. And and their first caliph, the Mahdi. Right? Like, so you see, and what, what do the hadith say? Oh, when you see a part of my ummah coming from Khurasan, carrying the black flags, and that will be uh, the imam, that will be your imam, and his name will be the Mahdi. <laughs> How bloody convenient. <laughs> This was pure politics, people. The Abbasids, um, the Abbasids were using this to overthrow the Umayyads, and just it was just their propaganda. That's all it was. Uh, Hassan Yusuf, who says, "Hey, bro, love from India, much love, right back at you, man." There is not so coming back to this topic. There is not a single hadith, people, about fighting India or fighting Hind. Okay, this Ghazwatul Hind is batil. Okay, there is no Sahih Hadith. And I'll ask people, I can challenge them to bring a Sahih Hadith that is Sahih by, as in uncritically Sahih. Not just, oh, we want it to be Sahih because I'm taking, picking and choosing. As in it cannot be criticized. Okay, right. So you bring that. This is not true. So people, and this is why Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal says, look, and this is the wisdom. Imam Ahmad does bring these hadith, but the hadith he brings in his musnad are not sahih. He writes that. And he himself says three topics have no basis to them. And I want you to take this into consideration, people. What are these three topics that have no three chapters, as in three books, he says, he says that these three categories have no basis to them. Laysa laha usul. One is al-maghazi. The battles led by the Prophet. He says these have no usul. You know when these people speak of the battles of the Prophet. Imam Ahmad is telling you that these things, yes there's many hadith, but 99% of it is all weak and made up. Right. So but we, you know, people may take them as stories and things like that. And he said, Malahim, you know, these kind of, oh, that will be to do with the end of times. 
uh, and things like what will happen, the battles at the end of time, uh, all this, what Jesus comes in there, the Mahdi, uh, the, the fighting India, Ghazwatul Hind, all of these. La asla laha. They don't have no usul. And the third, tafsir. Tafsir of the Quran, people, much of the tafsir in hadith that you have is actually baseless. And that reaches as much of the tafsir from hadith. Right, is actually just made up, and this is Imam Ahmad teaching us this. But yet, people don't take this. You know, Imam Ahmad says things like this, and people say, "Oh, you know, when it's convenient, they will just turn a blind eye." Imam Ahmad said, "Manidda al ijma fawa kathib." This is from Imam Ahmad. Manidda al ijma fawa kathib. Whosoever claims that there is a consensus is a liar, and people just turn away. They don't want to know. Imam Ahmad says these three, Laysat laha usul, al maghazi al malahim al tafsir, people turn away. See, this is selective, like, because we just want to support our narrative. So I just wanted to clarify this that look, there is no fight, no great war against India. The Prophet had never said this, okay. Then there is a debate that did the Arabs even know about India? And some people have said that Hind was referring to Basra in Iraq and other places. And But my personal opinion is that I think that the Arabs did know about India, about Hind. Um, because traditionally the term Hind comes from Sindh. Okay, so people call India Hind. It was called uh, Hindustan or India from the Indus Valley and sorry the Indus River which is actually the Sindh River okay so the Indus Valley civilization is actually the Sindh civilization and that's what it's actually called in the text so they call it the Hadara to Wadi Sindh uh, and they call it even in, uh, in in Sanskrit and Hindi they will call it the Sindh kind of civilization not the Indus like in English because of the river Sindh which is called Indus in English but people tr kind of like for Sindh they kind of replaced it into Hind and then some people have said yes but they some people consider these to be two Sindh and Hind but my research does seem to show me that uh, they did know about India because there was trade between Arabia and India and certain things like kurumful and other kind of uh and other things as well like peppers like fulful and other things did come over from india uh to arabia and other things did as well there is a debate about muhannad the indian sword is that because of it being made from india and i i am inclined to it is so that's my understanding some people have argued that point that the arabs didn't even know india existed i i'm i'm pretty sure that they did and definitely after the Prophet they did, because, um, and there's some debate about an Indian king, even a representative coming and meeting the Prophet, there's some debate about that. But after the Prophet, we know in the Abbasid time for Bayt al-Hikmah, they translated uh, a Sanskrit work from, and in fact, they called over an Indian uh, scholar uh, who's... Um, it was a famous work, is it Surma something? It's, but the, the, the point is they translated his Sanskrit work and he then resided there for a while. And one of the famous Indian doctors actually treated Harun al-Rashid as well. So we definitely know that there was, you know, there definitely was contact after the Prophet's time. I believe even before the Prophet's time, they did know of India. That's, I'm inclined to that. Uh, so I'm not so convinced by the theory that they had no knowledge of India. Right, although I'm not so sure that is Hind the name, was it named after India? So I know like you'll have some of the companions like the women were named Hind. So the, the, the wife of Abu Sufyan, her name is Hind. Is that named after India? I'm not so convinced that is because if you look at the general Arab trend, they didn't used to name people after countries. Like, I mean, foreign, I mean ancient countries like they wouldn't do that generally as far as i'm aware maybe somebody here watching this has more research and they can uh let me know about that but cool i thought i'd uh 
share that that there is no authenticity on the Ghazwatul Hind. So we don't need to kind of beat the drums and uh, say that there's going to be some kind of war against India. <laughs> there, there isn't people, not from a religious perspective, uh, totally and absolutely not. Cool. Uh, any other interesting points? I'm thinking, shall we just, yeah, I think with that, shall we call it a night, folks? It's gone past uh, midnight. I was asked, uh, right, okay, one final thing. I was asked about <coughs> Uh, to, to comment on hadith, uh, <coughs> how do we know the authenticity of hadith? And this ties into, I'll answer into this, and this ties into, there's a video, another video made by my, <laughs> by one of my diehard, deep down diehard fans, uh, Baba Fariduddin Gangut Ali. <laughs> So Gangut Ali has made another video which is called Abu Layth versus Abu Layth. And I have to say, people, this guy is so obsessed with me. He said in one of his posts, he wrote this, that I have watched almost a hundred, I think he wrote 180 hours of Abu Layth to take out snippets. I had to like, like, Avidly, I had to like so carefully watch 180 hours of me. I mean, I don't even think I've watched 100. <laughs> I honestly, seriously, I wish I want to. I seriously want to employ this guy. Like, I, I want to. <laughs> I need people like that <laughs> that watch my recording so carefully so I can tell them to kind of piece kind of put together string together different clips this guy is such a keen viewer like please work for me <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of like spray the <laughs> what is it nach meri bulbul ke paisa milega ay gangutali nach meri gangutali ke paisa milega Right, so the thing is, look, this, I, he's, he's obsessed with me. There's a student and friend of mine, Abu Muawiyah, who, right, you, you may have seen on social media. This guy took his photographs from Instagram where he's smoking some shisha or something and started ripping into him as some kind of attack on me. <laughs> And he, he, he took Abu Muawiyah, Abu Muawiyah had made some post about how his journey through faith and how he struggled at some point and, and he questioned his faith, this whole faith of fearing God and things like this. And he abandoned the prayer until he kind of introspected and looked into and then he and then he writes at the end that he then rediscovered his journey to God, but this time built on love. And then he started to pray and he advises people to pray. But he ignored that part and he kind of cropped the top section where he abandoned the prayer and posted that and said, right, he said, this is the student of Abu Layth. <laughs> I mean, seriously, first of all, I want to say that he is such a loser. To be not only stalking me, but my friends and students. Right? Firstly, that I want to say that. Secondly, look, Abu Muawiyah is not my girlfriend. Like, <laughs> he's not like my my wife or something. Like, why are you telling me what he's doing? Like, I, you know, it's none of my business. It's none of your business, for God's sake. You know, Abu Muawiyah isn't even on Twitter. And this guy goes and posts it on Twitter. Like a loser. And oh, and Abu Muawiyah is not even on there. And how petty can you be? <laughs> and to crop out. And then he thinks that's somehow getting at me. You know, it's like, ha 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 ha. Like, like I'm not in a relationship with him. You know? <laughs> like, the guy's my friend and he's a student. 
But so what? What he does, you know, is smoking shisha. Like, I give a damn. I mean, smoking shisha is not haram anyway. But I mean, so what? I mean, what are you? Like his dad? <laughs> you know, this is how petty these people become. So, right, so he has been watching like 180 hours of mine recently and he made this clip and he put it on Twitter. That's his tweet that, guys, don't let this go in vain. I spent 180 hours watching Abu Layth to make this. So I, <laughs> I wanted to like make a fake profile and ask him, you know, because some people have been saying, oh, Mufti, could you put together some clips of yours when you're doing this or when you're cracking jokes or when you're reading poetry, for example? Uh, somebody asked me, can you put all these clips together? And I thought, I've asked some people, but that's so hard. And, and I, I want to ask him now. <laughs> I've got to make a fake profile to say, yeah, man, the Abu Layth guy. You know what will really do him over if you make a clip of all his poetry clips? Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, this guy is such a loser. Gangoteli. But anyway... So he makes this one clip saying Abu Layth versus Abu Layth. And, ah, uh, and anyway, so so many, so few people sent it to me. So I'm like, ah, uh, go on then. What the hell is this guy got to say? And that must be his joy that, yes. <laughs> so he begins it by some kind of story about M&Ms or something, which I totally couldn't get, honestly. I honestly did not get the relevance of that story about Somebody eat, said, eat an M&M, &M, but don't eat the red one. But then somebody said, don't eat the green one. Somebody said, don't eat the, I don't know, the, the brown one. And some, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I hate to be saying, honestly, I hate, it hurts me more than it hurts you to say this, that you need to stop watching me. <laughs> You need to stop. I, I can't believe I would ever say that to someone, but you need to stop watching me because your obsession levels are through the roof, man. Like your story doesn't even make any sense. I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he goes on to say, well, Abu Layth will refute himself. So what he does is he, he plays my clip of the video of the age of Aisha. And then he's trying to refute my points using me, my clips from other segments. So first of all, before I answer this, so he's saying that you're criticizing a narrator here. Sorry, you're using a narration from this narrator here from like, let's say, Urwa or Ibn Juraj or uh, Zuhri. But over there, you're criticizing Urwa and Ibn Juraj and Zuhri. Ha ha. So first of all, before I even answer, <laughs> I want to say, what are you even arguing for? Let's just take a breather. You're arguing for the argument that the prophet married a six-year-old kid. That's your argument. Yeah. And what am I arguing in that video that that's not true? That's nonsense. So all these people cheering him up. This is what you're arguing for. I mean... You can believe that if you want. I find it disgusting and so disappointing that you would hold the prophet in such low esteem to say he looked at a six-year-old kid and said, yeah, I'll, marry, I'll take her as a bride, but even if I'll wait three years to have sex, I think that's so disgusting and blasphemous and disrespectful towards our prophet. I've said that that's nonsense and only, I don't care what the people in the past bought it for whatever reason, it's not true and it's based on weak fabricated narrations. Now, but this is what that you're arguing for. I'll also remind you, and I've played this in the past, these are the same people, uh, Farid Ganguteli and his, uh, uh, and et al, and his kind of group in that, a video which I played on two occasions where they say, and it's on YouTube, where they say that, so what if the prophet was sexually impotent? Yes, yeah, so the prophet, he doesn't, for the prophet to be sexually capable, that's not a condition of Nabuwa. He can be impotent. This, these are the people, this is the Wahhabi mindset that they've got, how they hold the, the you know, the prophet in their mind. Like this is the regard 
that they have towards him and the consideration and respect and reveration. So the reverence. So if that's your attitude towards the prophet, you know, like what do we expect from people like you? We're not going to expect. There's no hope, mate. So, OK, put that aside. Now I'll answer your questions. Right. Look, when I've answered this before and I'll repeat it again. That look, when we look at hadith in the past, how can we believe Islam is for all times? Do we agree? That let's, let's take this step by step, briefly. Step one, do we believe that Islam is for all times? Yes, we do. Tick. Do we believe that we can access the information about Islam in all times? Access it meaningfully. We can access it. Tick. Now here there's a problem. The hadith that we have today, how do we know these hadith are true? This is a question. Yeah, this is a question. Now some people will answer this by saying, oh, that's easy. We will look at the chains. Hmm. Okay, point. The problem here, so when you say this, okay, go to the next checkpoint. The problem here is that, okay, we look at the chain. How we verify the chain through the books of Rijal that say that do like CRB checks on these people. This narrator weak, this narrator reliable, this narrator problematic or OK. Problem number one is there's a ton of opinions on each narrator. Somebody saying is OK, somebody saying is utterly unacceptable. OK, so, you know, Imam Nasai is saying uh, a waste. Uh, Ismail ibn Abi Awais is unacceptable, Bukhari is saying is okay. So this, you've got problems, okay, so different, like an utter clash, a yes and a no from different people on most narrators. Problem number one. Problem number two is even if, let's just take the fact somebody says, oh, he was okay. He's, he had a good memory. The question is, the bigger question is, how do we know that that was true because these people that are saying it didn't actually ever meet him. So even if Imam Bukhari said, let's say Imam Bukhari said that uh, Urwa had an amazing memory. Let's just take that as a point. But Imam Bukhari never ever met Urwa. And he wouldn't have known anybody that directly knew Urwa. So him vouching for him Hmm, how, how is that equally meaningful for us today? So how? Because let's just be transparent, because remember, most of these people didn't ever meet the people they were speaking about. The, most of the people they're speaking about, the majority, they never ever met them in their lifetimes, ever. Like they, they had long died before them. So the question is, well, how did they know they were truthful? Well, you'll say, well, I'm sure their teachers would have told them and their teachers got it from their teachers who got it from somebody who would have known him. Possibly. I agree. That's the theory. But we don't know because we don't have those names. We don't. They haven't told us that. That is our guesswork. So, OK, so let's agree on that. So the truth is that we have people saying things about people who they never even ever knew personally. And they couldn't have met them because they died generations before they were even born. So, but we take it in some good faith. But the problem is now we're going to make judgments based on this. So good faith, hmm, you know, we need to take it with a pinch of salt because it's just good faith at the end of the day. So we fall back on the three principles that the scholars of Hadith taught us. And the scholars of Islam, that whenever a riwayah comes to us, a hadith, it must not clash with reason. La yubayin al maqul. Right? Lam yubayin al maqul. Lam yukhalif al manqul. It cannot go against the Quran and it cannot uproot. Lam yunaqid al usul. It cannot uproot an Islamic principle. Once these three are fine, then okay. Now we can. Take from these people, if that if they've said that, and we can even take from people we, who we wouldn't primarily take from. So 
by the first and general preference, we will take from people who have been deemed okay now. So they've passed that check. People said they were okay, but they have to pass these things. Once they pass all of this, fine. Then we will take from them. Okay, so that's the criteria. So when I'm saying that, look, the age of Aisha, why is this problematic? Because it seems to go against, right? It, it, seem, it goes against reason. It clashes that the prophet would have, uh, that if he's a prophet of God, why? how could a prophet of God be doing something like that? Be even looking at a girl like that, like for marriage, who is just a kid. That goes against reason that either he's not a prophet of God then, or if he's a prophet of God, then he wouldn't be doing things like that. So it goes against reason. It seems to go against the Quran. Because the Quran seems to suggest that the women marrying, it refers to them as women. Right? That marry the women. Don't stop the women from marrying. You don't refer to little kids. And when the Quran is referring, even in those ayat that people say are talking about Aisha, that they say that, uh, and Allah says, Ya Nisa and Nabi, that the women of the Prophet. What is a 10-year-old a woman? And now they're going to try and reverse engineer that, but people don't refer to little kids as women. right? So the Quran seems to be going against that understanding. The Quran seems to address children as separately. It doesn't, it doesn't, the Quran doesn't even, uh, <coughs> the Quran doesn't even obligate them with salah at that age. So a girl that doesn't even have to pray can be making judgments about marriage. And you'll say, well, no, she doesn't have to make the judgment. Ah, oh, so it's forced upon her. And the Quran says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no compulsion. So it goes again, and then it uproots Islamic principles, people. It uproots the principle that marriage needs consent. The consent, ridha tarafain. And how can a six-year-old consent? And you can say, well, yeah, she can understand. Well, okay, can she consent to a transaction? Can a six-year-old be, be purchasing land? No, not in according to Islamic uh, law, not even according to regular common law. Six-year-old can't go and purchase land, can't purchase a property, can't purchase a car, can't purchase things because she's just a child. Oh, so she can't comprehend that, but she can comprehend marriage. So either she's capable and if you say she's capable, then why can't she be? Why? Uh, why can't she pray? She ought to be sinful for not praying then. So Allah hasn't even mandated Salah for her till according to the Islamic principle until the age of 10 to some discernment. And that's just for prayer. That's just like doing rituals. That's not even a complicated thing. So yet, so when you look at the, the principles of like commerce, a child cannot conduct commerce on its own. A child cannot go to war. A child cannot delegate things to other people. A child in Islam cannot even manage its own finances. Like, be into, like let's say there was a certain amount of wealth left for a child. Uh, let's say like uh, a child was orphaned at the age of 10 or 9, a nine-year-old, let's take a nine-year-old, and there was wealth left, that is not handed over to the child, a guardian watches over until they become balir, until they become pubescent, and then you test them so long as they don't have any mental defect, and then you hand it over to them. That's in the Quran, and that's an Islamic principle. So it goes against this. So it's going against the Quran, it's going against the uh, reason, it's going against the Islamic principles and the great narrative that why the Prophet married anyway because of the year of sorrow. So yes, then we see that these narrators have been problematic as well. And I've highlighted that. And we show that this doesn't make any sense. And Urwa, we know that Urwa was the nephew of Aisha. And certain people did try to hurl allegations at Aisha at a later age, saying that she had committed adultery and things like this. And before she married the Prophet, 
And it makes sense that maybe Urwa fabricated or misrepresented uh, or misrelayed, as in the, when it came to that narration, he maybe pushed back her age to show that, oh, but she married the Prophet as a child because he was really fond of Aisha, who was his aunt. And when there were a lot of allegations uh, by people, obviously Muslim generally don't believe that, but there were some people at the time who were trying to say, oh, Aisha had committed adultery before she married the Prophet and so on. And this is why she knew that uh, Safwan, when, uh, you know, the whole hadith or ifk, uh, the, when there was the allegation that she had an affair with him. But they were saying later on, although Allah exonerates her in the Quran, they were saying, well, how did he know her from before? So some people made up stories later on in the generations after the Prophet that, oh, she must have had an affair with him before she met the Prophet. Now, so Urwa most likely, if anything, may have pushed back her age to kind of to make her seem like, oh, what are you talking about? She was so young when she married the Prophet. How could have she had an affair? That's one interpretation. I'm not saying that is what happened, but that's plausible. But the point is that th this content is baseless. So yes, if we find a narration by Urwa or Ibn Juraj or uh, let's say Zuhri, which complements these three things. So let's say you find a narration by uh, Ibn Juraj or Urwa saying there are five salahs in one day. Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem. Let's say you find a narration by, by these or other people saying that alcohol is haram in Islam. Is that a problem? Because they've been criticized? No, it's not a problem because it complements these three. If you find a narration saying something like, oh, you know, there's a virtue in reading the Quran on some, fine, you can act by it. But if you find something that throws the whole character of the Prophet under the bus and they've been criticized, then na munna na. This, uh, this one, not nice, my friend. So here we stop that and that's where we stamp things down. So I hope that makes sense. So these people who say, oh, but Mufti has criticized Urwa here, but uh, sorry, used a narration from him here, but he's criticized him here. Yes, I'm not saying that everything, just because I do feel that these people have said certain things and they have maybe at times misinformed. But it doesn't mean everything they did in their life was misinforming. It doesn't mean that. I mean, that would be absurd to assume even the most, even if you take the kathab, from the books of Kazabin, those who are utter liars in narration. I'm sure not everything they said in their life was a lie. You know, if you get a, a Kazab Rawi, I don't know, Khalid al Madaini or other people or pure Kazabin, and then they say, Oh, here's a hadith that La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, doesn't mean that's a lie. Just because they're a lie, doesn't mean that they have to lie in everything or misinform in everything. So, Use your common sense for God's sake, right? So I hope that's some sense to Gangute Lisa, right? Uh, guys, other than that, it's been uh, an epic evening. We've gone on for a while. Some people are just tuning in now. Sharmila Afzal just tuning in now. Ahlan was Ahlan. You're going to have to catch up with what's been going on. If you've got any questions, do reach out to me. Messenger, Facebook Messenger. Or you can do my other uh, Facebook uh, profile as well, the public profile. But do like and follow both people. I do uh, share messages from both. And I almost, I was almost about to say you can WhatsApp me. <laughs> so you can Snapchat me, Malm uh, 2014 or Facebook. People, till next week. Uh, all right, I think... Uh, I think that's right. Otherwise, it's going to go on way too much. Till next week, people, take very good care of yourselves. Much love. Mwah. Right. Gio. 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 Over and out. Over and out.